I give you a moment of pause to reflect as a Christian. But by that, I mean, you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day to give you eternal life. The moment you believe it, you have it. You believe you receive. And now I speak to you as a Christian. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. How do I know you're either carnal or spiritual any given moment in your life? How do you know if you're carnal? Well, there's awareness of personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. If you're aware of that, either by conscience or by conviction of the Holy Spirit, you should confess it in silence and privacy before study. Because you can't study the Bible in carnality. Can't, you can't get any divine revelation from it. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. So 1 John 1, 9 tells you how to correct this. It says, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us. And that puts you back into the ministry of the Holy Spirit, teach you, you the truth of the word of God. It is the truth of the word of God that sets you free from the cosmic system of, of falsehood. So I give you a moment. This is true for the Internet people. If you've dropped in and visiting with us live stream, then this is for you, too. We expect the same courtesy of classroom etiquette. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and love and mercy. We pause during the month of December to celebrate the birth of Christ. We know it's not the month of his birth. We know that's April. But we celebrate it nevertheless. We celebrate the coming, the incarnation, the coming of the Messiah into the world to save the world from itself and from its sin. And so we thank you for it. We'll celebrate all month. with key Bible lessons on Tuesday night. I pray tonight, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister to us. Joseph enters into a great crisis, not on his own, but has come to his life, and he has to deal with it. There's a great lesson here for us as Christians. How do we deal with those crises that come into our life, not volitionally, but by the will of God? And how do we deal with them? And in the end, are they resolved by the word of God and the grace of God? We pray that in our life through this study in Jesus name. Amen. Well, we're looking at part two from last night's study. God with us taken from Matthew 1, 18 through 25. And we're we're refocusing on the specific uh, thing that uh, Joseph needs to know the directive will of God. And he is really struggling in his life with an issue that was not created by his volition, but rather handed to, him, handed to him by the will of God. And handling that situation in a crisis is really important in his life. And we saw last time that he had a real problem with that because of a false assumption. His false assumption was, here, here's what was true. Mary came home after a three months visit with Elizabeth pregnant. He knew it wasn't his. And so he assumed that she had had sexual relations in some way or form or another with another man. And apparently no matter, no matter, it doesn't matter what she told him. <laughs> they must have had a conversation about this, don't you imagine? I mean, how not? I mean, they're engaged to be married. Uh, as far as we know, they had a very good, strong spiritual relationship up to this time. But he's not buying anything. He assumes that she's gotten pregnant by another man, but the truth of the matter is she's gotten pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Luke, the first chapter. But he made a false assumption and began to build all, make all of his decisions on a false assumption. And, and, and he's about, and listen, and he's now working against the plan of God. 
because when she got pregnant three months ago, the, as I said last night, the train had pulled out of the station. The plan of God was already in motion. Now, all you can do now is go with it. If you fight it, you're going to get run over. And, um, and he is, but he, he has positive volition towards God. But he thinks, he, in his own mind, he thinks he's made the right decision. <clears throat> and he didn't thoroughly investigate the word of God. And so we talked about that last night. If you recall, we talked about uh, Matthew, the first chapter of Matthew deals with Joseph's side of this. And Luke 1 and 2 deal, uh, deal with the uh, Mary side of it. If you want to know how Mary dealt with it, you can read that. If you want to know how Joseph did it, then we're dealing with Matthew 1 because that's how Joseph dealt with it. <clears throat> and, uh, and he corrected it. At the end of, of the first chapter of Matthew, he, he, he got up and did the will of God, didn't he? Because he didn't thoroughly understand it. Well, anyhow, part two of God with us tonight, I thought it would be important because of some interest we had last night in uh, Joseph's involvement and um, the question always arises, well, how come people didn't know about this? The truth of the matter is a lot of people did know about this. And so what I thought I would do under point one tonight was show you how much interest was already in this idea of the coming of Christ by the virgin birth. Okay? Now, this is really discussed in Luke 1 and 2. So I want us to go under point number one. At the time of Matthew 1 and 2 and the time of Luke 1 and 2, at the time, the, the biblical timing, there was a lot of excitement regarding the coming of Christ among, and this is important, among a pivot of spiritual mature believers in Israel. Now, we know the est religious establishment were apostate, right? The religious leaders were apostate. They're the same ones that are going to crucify him 30 years from now. They're apostate. But in, that, in the midst of the darkness of apostasy in Israel, there was a pivot, an enlightened group of Bible guys that were on fire for God and looking for the coming of Christ. I mean, they, and it, listen, there was excitement in the air. There was electricity in the air at this point. And I want to show you, I want to introduce you. To, now, Luke wanted to introduce you to all, some of the top people in this group. Not the whole group, but a lot of the top people in the group. These were the people that would come to Tuesday and Wednesday night Bible studies. Everybody comes on Sunday. The real true workers, the followers of Christ, come, when the, come, come for Bible study. So, I hope everybody's staying home tonight got that. At the time of Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2, there was a lot of excitement. It, it, there was electricity in the air about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at the time the Lord Jesus Christ came. I mean, God was way ahead of this program with a, with a wonderful group of people who were interested in study of the Bible and, you know, uh, the a living book for living people that wanted to live the book. And, and we meet these guys. For example, in the first chapter, we meet uh, a priest by the name of Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. They were part of this group. They were part of this spiritual mature group of people that God is included. Because listen, God always works through spirit. He doesn't work through the body of Christ that's negative. He works through the small group of the body of Christ that is positive. You understand? I don't care how many people have. It's how many that actually are engaged in the plan of God. I mean, you can have 2,000 people and none of them get a hoot about God. They just dress up and go to church. There's a, there's a marked difference here. There were a lot of people that went to the synagogue, did all the ceremonies, went through all the rituals, and were lost as Hogan's goat. Hogan's goat don't get much, don't get much press, does he? Not good press, anyhow. Well, we meet Elizabeth, Zachariah and Elizabeth, who are going to become the parents. You remember that miraculous birth conception, right? There with her, she's over age. She's like, this, is, this couple is like Abraham and Sarah. Um, 
We've met them in chapter one of Luke. In chapter two of Luke, we're going to meet some more. Now, of course, we've met Mary. We're going to meet Mary in the first chapter of Luke. And then uh, we met Joseph in Matthew one, right? That was, They were part of this group. And in the chapter two, in the birth story of Christ, we're going to meet two people that are really important, Simeon and Anna. So I want you to go to your Bibles to Luke, the second chapter. I want to introduce them. And I want you to hear how they describe this. And this gives us a clue about this wonderful pivot of, of spiritual believers in Israel at the time of the birth of Christ who were looking for it. They were, there was excitement in this group. Listen, and, and listen, l listen to me. L look up here. This kind of excitement that was going on at that time is what's going on in the church today looking for the second coming of Christ. I mean, who doesn't know something about the second coming of Christ? The rapture of the church, the tribulation, right? I mean, who doesn't know a little, a little something, right? This is what was going on about the first coming when the first coming came. There was electricity in the air, and we see it in these people. Now, I'm in Luke, the second chapter on your paper. I ask you to look at verse 25, second chapter 25. We're going to meet Simeon. And it goes through about verse 35. I'm just going to look at Simeon a little bit. Uh, verse 25, we're, we're introduced to Simeon. He's a righteous man, devout. Watch this now. Looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Remember that in the Jewish age, the Spirit didn't go in you. It went on you. All right. Uh, so he's righteous. He's devout. He's a believer. He's a devout believer. And he's a devout believer in the coming of Christ. Huh? The consolation of Israel, he'll explain it. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by that Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Christ. See, he's talking about first coming. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents, that is Joseph and Mary, brought in the child Jesus uh, to carry to carry out for him the custom of the law. You know, this is the, the Jewish custom of, you know, naming, circumcision, all that business. Then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, thou dost let thy bondservant depart in peace according to your word. In other words, he promised you will not see death until you see the coming of Christ, right? He said, listen, I've seen it. I'm an old man. I'm ready. I'm... Check me off the list. My, you know, people talk about the bucket list. This was on his bucket list. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, that is Christ. Christ is the salvation, which thou pre prepared in the presence of all people. Now watch this. I really pounded this last night. Do you know the great book? You know what the great book that people study about the second coming? Tell, tell me the book. Revelation. Revelation. You know what big book they studied about the first coming? Isaiah. Isaiah. 26 chapters of Isaiah are devoted to the coming of Christ. Out of 66 books, out of 66 chapters, 26 of them, I wrote them down. Chapter, you don't have to write them down. I did put them on your paper. I'm just telling you. Chapter 1, 2, 6, 7, 9, 11, 26, 35, 40, 42, 49, 53, 55, 57, 59, 61 are all messianic passages on the coming of Christ. Simeon, this was his book on the coming of Christ, just like the second coming book is Revelation. Right? Every, I mean, everybody. That's a gate question we'd all get in with. What is the one book that talks about the second coming of Christ? Everybody would say Revelation, right? And those who are more learned in it would talk about, you know, uh, Corinthians and Thessalonians and things like that. Straight out, if you ask the book, they would have. If you, in the day of Simeon, the book on the coming of Christ was Isaiah. Isaiah. Now he's going to quote in verse in verse 32. He quotes. Uh, uh, and if you have a study Bible, 
you will see there, when you look in there, you're going to see Isaiah 9, 42, 49, 51, 60. Do you, have a, do you see that? I mean, the, he's quoting a verse that was one of the big verses out of the coming of the Messiah, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. The coming, the first, we call it the first coming, the first coming of Christ. I'm telling you that when people that without knowledge, they go in and they see poor old Joseph in there and they say, we're tough on it. And, and, and we are a little bit. There's no doubt about that. But listen, this was the book. Everybody in that pivot, this was the book. They studied that. They wore that book out. And when he holds that baby in his arms and says, oh, dear God. You've allowed me. I have prayed that I might see live in the days of the coming of Christ. You've brought it to pass. I am ready. Check that off my bucket list. I am ready to go home. And he talks about the consolation of Israel. The Messiah would come and bring salvation and not to the Jew alone, but to the Gentile. He would bring salvation to the whole world. So before Jesus leaves the earth, he says to his followers, go to all the nations of the earth and tell them the story of salvation by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift. Let me tell you, this group of people, they knew the book of Isaiah. And who are in this group? I'll tell you who's in this group. This little Bible study group in Jerusalem, I'll tell you who's in it. Zechariah, Elizabeth, Mary, Joseph, Simon, Simeon, and Anna. For sure, for sure, for sure. Who else would be interested in the Bible studies that flowed from that? The, the, I'll tell you who. The temple shepherds. I'll tell you somebody else. The Magi was interested in this. I mean, there was so much excitement in the air. At the time of the birth of Christ, God, God in his marvelous grace, don't allow you to miss stuff like this. Whatever he has to do to stir the pot and get it, get the, get the mojo going, God is good at that. <laughs> and sometimes we look at one passage and don't take it in context, and I sometimes is guilty of that as a teacher teaching this soul ball, sometimes, unless I have somebody in class goes, well, what about this? I forget about all that stuff myself. Then somebody reminds me, and it takes me back to show you that this wasn't, Joseph was part of an, an enormous Bible study group that was on top of the game, just like you. And, uh, and then we meet Anna. Look at this. In, the, in verse, uh, we drop down, into um, verse, uh, let's see, Simeon is still going. Then we get to verse 36, a prophetess, Anna, and she's from the tribe of Asher. She was advanced a year, that, yeah, from her tribe. She's from the tribe of Asher. Uh, her name is. She was advancing years, having lived with a husband seven years after her marriage. She was a widow, verse 39. At the age of 84, she had never left the temple, serving night and day with fasting and prayer. And at that very moment, what, what very moment? The electricity in the air in another part of the temple where Simeon was doing his deal. She went. He's really excited. What's going on? What's that old man so excited about? You understand? I mean, he's, you know, he's dancing on top of the tables. And at that very moment, she came up and she began to give in thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were, watch this, looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. They were all in high anticipation. 
that they believed because of the excitement at the time that they, before they died, would see the coming of Christ and be a part of it. And God honored it. Isn't that wonderful? So Joseph wasn't an isolated. I want to tell you, Joseph wasn't an isolated fact. You understand that? There's some fill-in background. I mean, you can see why they all quoted out of, out of the great prophets. They're all quoting out of Isaiah, Isaiah primarily, but they're they're all over the Micah. They're in the Micah, Jer, they're into Jeremiah. They're all over the major prophets and everything they put their hands on with the coming of Christ. That's what you do in Bible study, you know. You study the plan of God and where you are in it. That's why we talk about the church and this next thing on the agenda is the rapture of the church, then the tribulation. Aren't we looking forward to the coming of Christ? We looking forward to that. Well, another example might be, you know what? Some theologians, greater students than myself of the book of Isaiah, they refer that they refer to the theme of the book of Isaiah as the redemptive work of Christ in prophecy. The redemptive work of Christ in prophecy. The Magi from the east, they show up in Jerusalem and request to a visit to pay homage to the king of the Jews. They talk to Herod. Herod immediately calls his religious advisors and he wants to know before the day's over and when he said it, you better get it done. Because he'd just as soon kill you as a stray dog. The spiritual advisors came to Herod and reported Micah 5 2 that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. They said, Well, thank you. And they went on their way. And guess how they found the house? He didn't give them the house address. He, he didn't give them the house address, he gave them the city. It's about like going to Rimlap. I don't know if they have street addresses. I think they have routes, routes, routes. <laughs> R-O-U-T-E. What was really funny, I, mean, I grew up a country boy. We had R-T on it. R-T. Yeah. Route. 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 I'm going to call it route. Okay, you call it whatever you want. You call it Robert. And I, about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years after I left home, I went home. They had an address, a street, and nothing had changed. I mean, I could have got home in a storm, blind, a blinding storm, and known how to get there. You know what I mean? <laughs> Nothing had changed. Everything looked identical when I had left 15 years ago, except everybody now had 324 Stony Lake Drive or something. I went, you guys are so uptown. Well, anyhow. So they sent him there, and what got him to the house? You remember the story? The star that led him. And God, good. You think you have, listen, he'll give you a sea night dog or a star, but he's going to get you where you got to go, right? I mean, you may even be right a horse that'll talk to you before you get there, right? A donkey, yeah. Yeah, donkey, thank you. Now, I've got the donkey and the root route. So here we are, uh, Simeon, he quotes uh, 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 Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. And of course, Joseph, the angel shows up to Joseph in our story of Matthew 1 and says, uh, Isaiah seven fourteen. 
This one's the first time he heard that either. In, in, listen, in deep sleep, the angel goes like, Isaiah 7, 14. And he goes like, ding, ding, wakes up, right? Gets up. And it can't go back to sleep on that deal. I mean, a visiting angel show up in deep sleep. You, that'd be Santa Claus. It was Isaiah that introduced the messianic title, Emmanuel, God with us, which is really an interpretation of hypostatic union and theology. And listen, Emmanuel, the only place, listen, it's not just in chapter 7, it's in chapter 8. And I wrote it, not only is it listed in 714, it's listed in 88 and 810, the word Emmanuel. One time, I think it's in verse 10, it's trans, instead of giving you Emmanuel, it says God with us, which is Emmanuel. God with us. And what an interesting word Emmanuel is. See the E-L on the end of the word? That's the word God. The rest of that word is a, a preposition uh, with, a plural, with a, a plural ending. It's a preposition with a plural ending. Emmanuel. I mean, it sounds like a great, big, important word, doesn't it? It's a preposition attached to God. God with us. It's just, I don't know. The language is, is a fun language. And uh, God sends, God sends uh, an angel to tutor him, right? He sent the angel to tutor him. God is so good. <laughs> God is so good. Said it. Uh, set an angel to tutor him. I mean, bet. And he's done one better for you. Yeah, he put the Holy Spirit in you to tutor you. That's better than an angel. That's God. He put a tutor. Listen, you got the tutor that lives in you. There's no, there's no excuse for being dumb spiritually. Right? No excuse. Either you don't want to study, you don't want to apply, but there's no excuse. You got the tutor of tutors, 1 John 2, 1 John 2, 1 John 4. You got a tutor. He who lives in you is greater than he who lives in the world, 1 John 4, 4. Notice that God chose Joseph like Mary for the fulfillment of this prophecy. He picked them both, didn't he? He didn't pick just Mary. He picked Joseph and Mary. He got Mary. Then he goes back. Joseph is stumbling all over the place. I don't know what to do. Um, you know, and so he has to show up and clear that up. He picked them both to be the parents. I mean, sometimes, <laughs> at least in my life, I question God so much about picking me to do anything. You pick me be the pastor of the church. Are you nuts? Are you nuts? Oh, I know. Just send me money. I mean, God puts you in some of the most amazing situations of your life so that he just shines. Sometimes we can't see it when there's so much light around us, so he lets us get into a crevice and then just puts a light on us. Amazing God. It's an amazing Father. What a daddy. <laughs> what a daddy. And you know, we know that this is true because he set up the whole genealogy and puts both of them in the genealogy, doesn't he? Matthew 1, genealogy. Luke 3, genealogy. I mean, he runs them back. You know, they probably got thinking, well, I don't know if I'm going to. I mean, what a tough job to parent the son of God. <laughs> you think you got a tough job? Huh? Think about that assignment. Every time I would get a little depressed about being in the, the pastoral ministry, he would remind me, you could have been in the genealogy. Think what that thing would have been like. Suppose he had picked you to raise his son. I went, oh, forget it. <laughs> I wouldn't have, man, I'd been burnt toast about the first week. About the time I got up on the house, I'd have fallen. 
Ho, ho, ho. The virgin birth introduced a period in biblical history, and this is really important. I want you to get this point too. The virgin birth, the virgin birth introduced a period in biblical history called the incarnation. Now, the incarnation is a Latin word composed of two words, the preposition in, and carnation is the word flesh, in flesh, in the form of flesh. It's Latin. Virgin birth introduced a period called incarnation, consisting of two words, in the flesh or in human form. John 1, 14 through 18 is a classic. It's a, you know, this is famous. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. You remember that. What you might have missed later down in that, like down into verse 18 or so, when it says, and grace and truth came through the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came into the world through human form. The Word became flesh, and out of the Word of flesh came truth and grace to the human race. Hmm? So why would we not hear Peter say in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Or, or 1 Timothy 2.4. It is God's desire that you be saved and come to the full knowledge. Why would he not say those things? God is so good. He is so good. He is so good all the time. And he is so good all the time. So the incarnation composed of these two words. And um, like in John 6.51 when he's talking about the living bread that came down out of heaven. And he says... Those who eat live forever. And then, he, and then he makes this great statement. He says, the life of the world is in my flesh. Therefore, those who believe in me will live forever. Those who believe in me believe that I came to die on a cross for their sins, be buried and raised from the dead the third day. Those who believe in me will live forever. Don't you love that? You know what that is? That's grace. You don't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's a gift from God to you through his son. What a... The son of God born in human form, we call in theology, we call it hypostatic union, which in lay terms mean undiminished deity. He's 100% God and 100% man in one human form. That's the importance of the virgin birth, by the way. I want you to look at Philippians we, we all the time read Hebrews 1, 3, which is a great passage, and I wrote it down. But let's, let's put our eyes on Philippians. Here's Ephesians, Philippians. The second chapter, we're looking at verses 6. Well, well, we'll start with verse 5. Have this attitude in yourself, which was in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, that's kenosis, emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, yes, death on the cross. That is why God has exalted him with a name above every name. Did you get that? Do you get the importance of why he came in human form? And why he emptied himself in kenosis in order to hang on the cross to become the sin offering for the world? Do you get that? It's a doctrine of kenosis, by the way, in theology. Um, you can see the second, the second Corinthians 4, 4 is going to tell you that. And, of course, John 14, 8 through 11. You remember we studied that Sunday. Philip says, show us the Father. He says, are you kidding me? And that's Ron's interpretation, but are you kidding me? For three and a half years, I've shown you more of the Father than any, any one human being has ever seen. And you say, show me the Father. You've seen the Father if you've seen me. 
How about that? I don't know what we think we would get if we saw everything. But whatever you're thinking about wouldn't be enough. <laughs> oh, if, I, if God would come and do, if God would do this, if God would do that. God, yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, you'd still be the same slug because you have to walk by faith, not by sight. You'd be the same person. Nothing changed. Maybe your ego. I saw. Hebrews 1 3, that's one of my favorites. He's the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. I love it. Boy, you ought to claim John 17 21, boy. That's your verse. Jesus prayed that all who believe in me may be. As we are one. How about that? The Father and I are one. Every person that comes into Christ is one with the Father and the Son. That's pretty good company, wouldn't you agree? One with the Father and the Son? About as good as it gets, huh, Frank? Take that Christmas gift every day. John 17, 21, that's your gift. That's your Christmas gift, Frank. Read it every day of this Christmas and you'll be a better man for it. Yeah, you bet. The incarnation became also a period in Messianic history. Now watch this. The incarnation also became a period in Messianic history between the virgin birth, the death, burial, and resurrection, and the ascension session of Jesus Christ. Now listen, and the church age. We call that the incarnation period. Because that is the period of the first advent business. Now we look for him to come back and do the second advent, right? Do you see why? Listen, the church, he's going to come back. The church is going to leave, and then we're, we're into another ball game, right? All right. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you one more thing that's really important. It's on your paper. I'm going to tell you the third thing about the incarnation that's important in my opinion. Since I'm the teacher, that opinion is a good, right? There. The incarnation is an important key. Now, what? listen to this, is an important key to the fulfillment, listen, of the old covenant. The incarnation is going to fulfill the old covenant and it's going to institute the new covenant. The incarnation is going to fulfill the old and institute the new covenant. Therefore, when we do the Eucharist on the first Sunday of every month, we lift the cup. Of the blood of the new covenant. Because we're new covenant people. We're not old covenant people. We are new covenant people. And the new covenant people are looking for the fulfillment of that. With the second coming of Christ, the new covenant will be brought to fulfillment through the second coming of Christ. It's instituted in the first. Brought to completion in the second. And that's the power of the incarnation. Listen, that's the power of understanding the incarnation. This is an enormous period of human history. Oh, here's point number three. The virgin birth. Now, boy, this is a good one. This is the one that picks you up where you are. This, this, this one picks up where you are. The virgin birth was one of three messianic signs out of the book of Isaiah. of the coming judgment of the fifth cycle upon Israel, specifically upon Judah. Isaiah 7, 14, it starts with the virgin birth. Isaiah 7, 14. <clears throat> it goes to Isaiah 53, 1 through 12, which is about the crucifixion of Christ. It goes to Isaiah 28, 9 through 11, which is tongues of the church age. And Isaiah prophesied the coming fifth in history, in, 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 in the period of the Messiah, which we call the incarnation period. In this incarnation period, tongues would become an issue 
to declare the fifth cycle of discipline to Judah. And I put them on your paper for you to study. For example, Isaiah 28, 9 through 11. Let me show it to you in the church age. Go to your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14. This is Isaiah talking about this period. 14, uh, 21. Now, he's talking about spiritual gifts, chapter 12, 13, 14. He's getting down to this now. We're in the church, right? We're talking to the church, the church at Corinth. In the law, verse 21, in the law, it is written, when he says the law, he's not talking technically, he's talking biblically. The Old Testament was divided into three sections, the law, the prophets, and the writings, or the law, the writings, and the prophets. You understand? So when he says the law, he's, and he quotes Isaiah, <laughs> he's not talking about the law He's talking about the old covenant. You understand that? Well, you got to understand. I mean, I can only tell you. Can't make you believe it. And so in verse 21, we have Isaiah 28, 11. You got a study Bible? Look over your margin. Does it show you Isaiah? He's quoting Isaiah, the prophet. The, he's out of the prophets. He's, he's talking about Isaiah 28, 11, right? Okay. By men of strange tongues, that's languages, and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to the people, and even so they will not listen to me, saith the Lord. Right? Now, it started at Pentecost, and it goes on in the church, in the book of Acts. It's going to go on until, until the, the, see, we're going from 30 A.D. until 70 A.D., in 70 A.D., Israel is going to go under the fifth cycle of discipline to Rome. Everybody knows this. If you're, if you're just a casual student and not even a believer, you know that Rome sacked Israel. Uh, uh, Titus just put a serious fifth on him. Okay. So then... Now, we're in the middle of the church age. Are you with me? See, when this is written, uh, we're uh, 60, somewhere around 50, 50, late 50s, early 60s, when this is being written. Right? So then tongues, now watch this. So then tongues, so we're being exercised since Pentecost into the church age because they're waiting on something. Tongues are going to be, are going to be seized by something within them. And that is their fulfillment. And so they consist. Now what? So then tongues are for a sign. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. The Jews seek signs. Gentiles seek wisdom. Remember that, Gentiles. Of course, we're believers now, aren't we? So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is for a sign not to unbelievers, but to believers. And that was a conflict they were having in the Corinthian church. In 70 AD, tongues are going to be gone. They never could be further down. Comes up never do they go here. Well, they can't, can they? If you believe in them. If you still got them after 70 AD, if you still believe in tongues after 70 AD, you sure can't quote that verse. You, you can't do that. Well, it doesn't matter to me. You understand? What matters to me is the truth of the word of God. That's what matters to me. And so, you know. Now, the background to this whole idea, that background to Isaiah 714, the background where this whole thing started with the virgin birth, the background to it was God gave Isaiah this prophecy to give to King Ahaz, that was the king of Judah. And they were at uh, the Syria and Ephraim. Now, that should be Ephraim. I think I misspelled it. There should be a P there. It's E-P-H, Ephraim. It's Ephraim. They, there was a war going on there. You can read about it, but th they were at war. And 
and you, when you read Isaiah seven through uh, nine, you can you it gives you that, and and chapter seven, eight, nine are heavy messianic. Isaiah warned the king not to join Assyria against Assyria, the Syria Ephraim alliance. Do not go to war against them. He was thinking, uh, maybe I ought to join Assyria against them. And, and, so, and so Isaiah came to him and said, uh, don't do that because you will fight God if you do that. The king was fearful of Isaiah's answer and asked for a sign of the Lord's deliverance. Isaiah gave him the sign and he didn't and he rejected it. When he rejected it, Isaiah gave him the sign of Emmanuel to Israel, to Judah, as a warning of the coming of the fifth cycle of discipline. And there you have it. And there you have it. So when you want to read about the five cycles of discipline, you read Leviticus 26 or Deuteronomy 28. And then you get into the book of Isaiah. I found something really important. There's this passage in Matthew, 11th chapter, verses 28 through 30, um, about weary. Um, let's see. Let me get that. I thought I had it. On there, but Matthew 11, as soon as you see it, you're going, ah, oh, yeah. I just can't remember how it started. Once I can get one thing started in my head, I can usually run with it, but I can't get that thing started. 28, uh, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Do you remember that? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. And what you're going to find is this is this is a concept coming out of all the major prophets like like uh, Jeremiah and and Isaiah. And when you read Isaiah 28 when he's talking about this tongues thing in business out of Isaiah 9 through 11, that's the passage that the prophetic idea of tongues, you're going to see that this is a point that's being made. Uh, Christ is the answer, isn't it? Well, I mean, what is the answer what is the answer to those who are weary and heavy laden, burdened in their life, who desire to find inner peace and rest? You know what the answer is? What? Come to me, he said. Come to me, all ye who are. What a great message we have the church of Jesus Christ. The problem is there's so many in the church with this that don't put their burden on Christ. You know, in that First Peter 5, 8, cast all your burdens upon me because I'm a burden carrying Christ. We don't do that. I mean, if we would do it, we'd find out that he's true to his word. And, and he will lift your burden. He won't say, well, you know, you got to change your ways. You got to do this. You got to do that. That's religion talking to you. That's not Jesus. He didn't say none of that to the woman caught in adultery, brought before him, and, and all the people wanted to stone her. That's not the church of Jesus Christ. That's religion. No, you're weary and heavy laden. You, you're looking for that inner peace in you. Jesus said, I know. Look, come to me. Come to me. You've, you've gone to all the wrong places. You've, you've gone to the drugs. You've gone to the alcohol. You've gone to the streets. You've gone to this. You've gone to that. You've gone to this. You've gone to that. Why don't you just stop by here? This is a one-shot stop. Yeah? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart. And then he, he quotes. You got a study Bible. You probably see Jeremiah somewhere in there. Verse 29. Jeremiah 6.16 or something like that. It's also Isaiah. Notice that God chose Joseph like Mary for the fulfillment of this prophecy. Like King Ahaz, 
The prophetic message of Emmanuel was brought to Joseph at a time of great personal struggle regarding the directive will of God. How, how are you going to live, Frank? How are any of us going to live without great struggles? And listen, what's a great struggle in one person's life is not a struggle in mine. What is in mine is not yours, right? But let me tell you one thing. You're not going to get out of this old place without some great struggle, right? And that great struggle, you can do one of two things with it. You can let it wear you down, weary you out, become weary and heavy laden from it. Or you can, First Peter 5, 8, you can cast upon the Lord because he's a load-carrying Savior. And you'd be surprised what he could exchange that load you're carrying for. And you know what? I've learned in my own personal life experience. He didn't, he, he, I prayed that prayer. He didn't change my circumstance and I owed a, not one. And so I go back and I ask him again. He didn't change my circumstance at all. I went back and asked him again. I'm a persistent guy. I need some relief. I can give you relief. I'm not going to change your circumstance, though. So. I said, what? I said, I'm not going to change your circumstance. I'm going to make you a better man out of it. I'm going to make you a better man because of it. That's what I'm going to do with you, Ron Adema. And it broke my heart to hear him say that because I thought, what is wrong with me? Did I not know that? Listen, I can take you weary and ladenness. I'm going to change your circumstance. My job is to make you a better person, make you a better man. I'm going to make you a better man one way or the other. I'm going to make you a better man. I said, well, let's take the easy way. But I need to, I'm not changing your circumstance. Get that straight. But I'll lift your burden, buddy. I'm leaving you in it. He did that with Joseph. Joseph wanted his circumstances to change, so I'm going to divorce. He wanted the pregnancy to change. I wish she had never come with that baby. I wish we'd never had that baby. Never wish we'd had that baby. Imagine what would happen if he got married with that attitude. Wish never had that baby. Wish had never had that baby. God changed that all, but never changed the circumstance. Didn't change, didn't change his circumstances all. Changed his heart. Listen to me now. Changed his heart. Changed his heart. Made a better man out of him. Not a bitter man. Made a better man. If he'd have stayed where he was, he'd have been a bitter man. God changed his heart. Changed his heart. You want a good Christmas gift? Let him change your heart. Let me tell you, there's the real deal. And then you look back and you go like, God, don't change a thing in my life. Don't change a thing. Don't change a thing. I'll accept it. I want to be that better man. I want to be a better one. I want to be a better one. That's what Joseph got. Joseph got a second chance with God. Come and get on the team. Let me make you a better man, not a bitter man. You see, the angel's message was not to change Joseph's circumstances, wasn't going to change his engagement or, his preg or the pregnancy, but rather what to trust in order for God to bring him through it. 
not about changing it. It's about trusting it and get you through it in a way that makes you better than when you went, entered it. Maybe he wants to make you a, a better teenager. Maybe he wants to make you a better woman. Maybe he wants to make you a, a better grandpa. I don't know what he wants, but he's after something better. All things work together for good. And somehow you've got to find what that means in your heart, in your own life. And it means something different to every person in this room. But he will certainly do it because he's a good God. He will certainly do it. All things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. We're all called according to his purpose. This is the Christmas I hope for your life. My message is designed to try to bring you to that place in your heart where you will let God champion the causes of your life. Let him champion them. He's, a, he's not a God who likes to sit on the sidelines. I can tell you that right now. He likes to be mixed in the midst of the game that he's established. He's the, he's the great coach of your life. Let's pray. My Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for that which our hearts have felt and experienced through the study of the life of Joseph. And what we learned from Joseph, we can apply to our own life as we talked about tonight. And Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be wearied and laden. Come to me, I will give you rest. I will give you the inner peace that you seek in all the wrong ways and all the wrong places. I love the fact, Father, that Jesus said you weren't a distant father, that you were a close father. One that walked with us and talked with us and was one with us. Meaning that we don't go through anything in life which God doesn't walk us walk with us. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He means that. We need to let him do that in our life. Stop beating yourself up. Turn it over. Let him do the miracle. This Christmas in each of our lives that he did in Joseph and Mary's. In Zechariah and Elizabeth, the temple shepherds, the Magi, Simeon and Anna, add us to that number in Jesus' name. Amen.